distinguished UAH contemporary art fellow, Sun Young Kang. Um, Sun Young, we are delighted to have you here, finally, after lots of delay, and to see the very components of our UAH contemporary fellow come together, from studio vis visits with um, students and artists in the community to the very dramatic installation now in Wilson Gallery. We extend special thanks to the National Endowment for the Arts, the Community Selection Board for the Contemporary Art Fellow, Low Mill Arts and Entertainment, the College of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences, especially our Dean Sean Lane, Midori Malone, and Jenny Russell, as well as our indefatigable gallery coordinator, Eileen Galloway. Sun Young received her MFA in Book Arts and Printmaking from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. As a book artist, an installation artist. Sun Young's practice uses ephemeral materials such as paper and light to explore how antithetical ideas inevitably converge in our existence. This exploration of paradoxical materials and concepts also underwrite her Wilson Gallery installation, In Between Presence and Absence, where among hundreds of hollow paper cast containers, emptiness and shadows vie for visibility and weight. Please join me in welcoming Sun Young. Uh, first of all, I have to say uh, I cannot like um, explain well enough how grateful I am to be to have this wonderful opportunity of exhibiting my work and meeting all of you. Um, it has been a really great experience and truly will be unforgettable. Um, also, this is a great honor to share more about my work in this presentation. So thank you for joining. Um, so um, as an artist, my interest in general is in exploring the duality that is fundamental to human existence. Um, <coughs> sorry of different uh, realities or worlds both in space and time and the tension between them and the, uh, and, the, and the coexistence of antithetical ideas such as how death implies life, how the material realm implies the unsubstantial or non-physical and how absence implies presence. Uh, my focus on this I think is from my personal experiences. First would be uh, being an immigrant uh, who is residing in between two different cultures. Um, for now, I, uh, I have spent half of my life in Korea and the other half in the U.S. So while I have two homes, I um, often feel that I'm unsettled in either place, but instead living on the edge of both sides. So I often wonder about the concept of boundaries or the space or time in between. Uh, also, the interrelation of different ideas or entities. Uh, and another reason is, uh, is my background, Korean painting, with its key aesthetic or philosophy of yabek. Uh, yabek is a Korean word. Um, it is like almost not non-translatable, but if I say that in English, it would be emptiness. Uh, as a uh, as an aesthetic, it is very important in many traditional Korean art form, not only the visual art, but also like literature, music, dance, and architecture and many. And also as a philosophical idea, it is relatable to Buddhism, Taoism, and even uh, contemplative lifestyle and contemporary life. So it could be a theme of a lifetime study for some people. Uh, but if I just have to explain what it is in Korean painting briefly, um, I tried. Uh, this, I found this a good example. It's um, quite famous online. It, the artist is unknown. It's probably from the Joseon era, the last dynasty. 
So you see that this um, blank spot, like that's not drawn, that's your back. I believe that you don't think that it's unfinished, even though that more than half is blank. Because this your back creates the balance of positive and negative space in the painting or drawing. And, con and also, conceptually, uh, this negative space stimulates the builder's imagination about what is not there and makes the artwork more interactive. So while Yobek is, uh, it means emptiness and indicates the negative space in a painting or drawing, it implies the opposite of the empty space because Yobek cannot exist if the whole drawing is just blank. So it's more about uh, the interrelation or coexistence of the visible and invisible rather than just dichotomy. Uh, so as someone who has been trained in Korean painting for many years, I have been definitely influenced by its philosophy and aesthetic. Um, the most obvious connections to Yobek in my work are the physical empty space as the key element, both conceptually and aesthetically and also the audience's presence and the interaction with my work, whether as a reader of my book or the physical part of the installation. And my practice usually uh, focus, focuses on the material itself, such as paper, thread, and hair, and light and shadow effects. Um, um, and each material has metaphoric meaning, which is essential to the theme or concept of my work. And the working process is usually simple but obsessively repetitive to represent um, to, or to visualize the time passing and to symbolize time made spatial that reflects the passage in between or across boundaries. So now I'm going to show you some examples of my previous work and the current work. Uh, this is an artist book. Um, through this book, I try to explore the idea of emptiness in Buddhism. Uh, I use the number 108, which is significant in Buddhism. The number 108 represents 108 different human agonies or desires that cause human suffering in Buddhism. So, um, hello? Oh, okay. I wanted to invite the readers to participate in the medita meditative practice similar to the Buddhist practices such as counting 108 beads or bowing 108 times for their like for emptying their mind of these desires or like for meditation. Uh, I made this book with 108 cut out pages. Uh, as the meaning of creating emptiness, and each page has one of the 108 combinations of 14 different words. Uh, on the right side, that's uh, something I came up after doing brief research about the number. So, to, so I try to visualize how the number 108 was created using these words. Uh, so conceptually, each page of this book constitutes one of the 108 human agonies or desires that we carry with us or we want to be free from to reach the true enlightenment in Buddhism. So, so when the readers turn each page 108 times, they can experience the 108 human agonies and as they are turning the pages, they can see the pile of 108 agonies or desires is getting smaller and smaller. And at the end, they can reach the emptiness, which is the last blank page of this book. This book also explores the emptiness in Buddhism, but instead of using the combinations, I created these 108 small boxes and they set within five larger boxes. These small boxes function as pages in this book and each box has a burnt out figure on its cover. Um, the figures are all Chinese characters, Tao, which has various meanings, including path or way. So all of the figures are uh, 108 different fonts or design of the one word Tao. Uh, they are all designed by different seal engravers or calligraphers. So if you read this book, whether you want or not, you're just saying path, 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 
repetitively for 108 times. Um, I took the box form to make this book because box, a box can physically contain space within. So both of the processes of making the empty boxes and burning letters 108 times are sort of meditative processes of creating physical and metaphorical emptiness. Uh, the concept of, so the concept of this book is that while the readers are turning the pages, actually opening the boxes, they can explore 108 different ways to be empty in this book. Um, the five larger boxes here are, uh, it's my reference of the five elements in Korean culture. They are wood, fire, water, metal, earth, and are believed to compose the, the universe and the nature. This number five can be found in Korean traditional step binding. There are always five holes that the needle goes through when you bind. Um, and it is the distinctiveness that makes Korean binding different from Chinese and Japanese bindings. They usually have even number, like four or six. Samsara is, this, it, this book is very small. It is only about one inch wide and a one and a quarter inch tall. But this miniature book contains a big idea. Um, it is talking about our world as a constantly changing or circulating nature. Um, I made these images of the peaceful calm water turning to the big waves and the tiny sprout becoming a big tree and an old stump. So all these time-based images are printed on the pages of this Tocito structure because the, the pages of this structure can be turned forever. So by using this structure, I wanted to show the idea that there is no ending and no beginning in the nature, but everything is only a moment that has never truly existed because nothing is stationary in the world, so nothing exists and everything is empty. In honor of my grandmother's simple life is a one-page book made from a single sheet of print on the right side. Uh, like, like the title, it is about my grandmother's life that was very simple. Um, my grandmother, she lived through the most difficult time of modern Korean history. She was the, I considered her the embodiment of the pain, struggle, and the sacrifice of the people, especially the mothers who held the family tight during all the tragedies, like Japanese colonialism and Korean War, and then the, the dictatorship, even though they had a name, president, and now so much killing. Um, so uh, her life made her mute and forgot how to laugh. I've never seen her laughing aloud, uh, but she just carried on very calmly. So when I was a little, I lived with my grandmother in her old house, and my memories of her have been always the biggest inspiration. Um, while I was in grad school in the U.S., and I, I lost her without knowing, so I had to make this work. It was sort of a personal mourning process. Her life and death uh, evoked the idea of the life circle in a family and in human life in general, like the sunrise and sunset. So uh, throughout the entire book, the image of the sun is always at the background of each drawing and the sun image lets you know that you have the sense of the time on each page. Uh, I depicted her long life as only one day of her life in this book. So the story starts from the morning with the sunrise and ends at night with the moon in the darkness. So this is, very, uh, this is a simple story of my grandmother's simple life as a mother and as a part of the nature. Memories Unfolded is also inspired by my memories of my grandmother. Uh, I call this book a shadow book because what I want to actually show you in this book is the shadows on the pages. And this book actually meant to be read under a lamplight in a dark space. <clears throat> on the light, as you spread out the pages, you can watch the shadows appear. But without light from the backside, you only see the blank pages. I designed this book with the accordion structure, which resembles to the folding screen. 
And I also created all these Korean traditional door patterns and used them as images and narratives in this book. Both the screen structure and the door images are metaphors of a boundary that implies the other side and connects this world and the other world while like which are life and death. So opening this book, it's spreading out the folding screen, which means evoking the spirit in Korean ancestor right. Personally, I wanted to create a moment when I was sitting in my grandmother's room in her house and watching her shadow, which was her presence on the paper doors that she cast from the outside of the room. So conceptually with this book opened, um, I can be once again sitting with her, with my grandmother, who is now on the other side. Um, the title of this book in Korean is Manbyal Iyagi. It literally means the story of thousands of stars. Manbyal, which just sounds like thousands of mil or millions of stars, is actually a made up word using the first and the last syllables of meeting, mannam and farewell, ibyal, respectively. So Manbyal Iyagi can be a story of meeting and farewell as well. The poem in this book is, is written in Korean by my uh, astronomer friend. So it's a collaborative project. Uh, on each page, all the syllables are separated and spread out so they were not readable. Then I drew lines between the syllables and reconnected all the, all the uh, separated ones. With the line drawings, all the spread out letters have orders and become readable again. Visually, I meant to create images of stars or constellation only using text instead of images to create a subtlety with empty space so that the readers have their own imaginary stars or, or sky while they were reading. Part of the poem is saying that uh, meeting and farewell are not separable, so we do not need to be happy for being together nor to be sad for being apart. It's like uh, without life, Without that, we cannot really appreciate living. So um, I designed this structure for this poem and created this book with two separated volumes in a circular shape, not only to depict the shape of my imaginary sky, but also to visualize the concept that the, the antithetical ideas like meeting, farewell, and the happiness and sadness are actually not separable. So each side of this book can be physically separated from each other and become its own circular shape, but this book cannot be completed without the other side. Um, this book has two separated space as, as the cover, and each contains a paper cut object inside. When the both box shaped covers are opened, these two objects are in the same space next to each other, and the sentence on each side of the boxes uh, can, be, can be completed. It's the presence only exists when the absence is recognized. Um, like most of my other projects, the process of making this book is as important as the finished project. Uh, so looking at this finished book, I wish you could imagine my working process. Uh, when I was cutting out the pages to create the absence on the text block on the right side, I was at the same time creating the presence on the left side. So I was conceptually emptying the bowl on the right, and that made me automatically fill up the other bowl on the left side. The process of creating this book for me was perceiving the idea of inseparability of presence and absence. So these opposite ideas, like presence and absence, full and empty are physically from one single paper. Filtered Memories and Living Shadow. This installation is composed of three pieces, 28 floating scroll books and a life-size folding screen and a water bowl with a print immersed in the water. This project was a kind of a collaboration with my father who had already passed away. The texts on each scroll are my father's handwriting from his old diary with excerpts translated and printed on the bottom of each scroll. 
Um, I used incense to burn out the text to make the whole process a ritual performance and also as a meaning to create physical emptiness to visualize the absence while I was carefully tracing his pen strokes. Uh, without light, these uh, pages are just blank. But when lit, text casts shadows and the absence becomes presence and people can read the shadows. For me, it calls to mind the memories of the one who is absent. This folding screen has my narrative printed on. The fragments of my memory related to my family. Um, both the screen and the paper used to create this screen are metaphors of inseparability. Light from one side casts shadow on the other. It just as life, this world is inseparable from death, the world beyond. This whole installation represents a Korean ancestor right. In Korea, when we have an ancestor right, we spread out the folding screen and burn incense as a means of evoking the spirit. This project is personally devoted to my father who passed away 20, year, 20 years ago. Um, also, the whole space is conceptually a giant book that people can read the text and see the images while they are walking through. Um, so the, these images are the, from the front of the scrolls, and you can what you see is the shadow, the text, the shadow that it, um, from cast from backside. No, okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's the shadow. You 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 read the shadow in this book, and this is the backside of the scroll. So you can see the uh, texture of the burnt letters. But if you try to read this, it's a backward. Um, and I place this water bowl as my conceptually, as my offering to my father. But also it functions as a colophon of this book that gives the audiences the brief idea of this whole project. In between, um, this installation consists of accumulated paper tubes and motion sensitive lights turning on and off depending on the audience's movement in a dark space. With this project, I try to create a metaphysical space visualizing the non-visual and the inseparability yet connection of antithetical ideas. So this larger piece consisting of all the tubes represents my idea of a boundary as not only a divider, but also one that creates or implies another space or entity. And I installed this structure horizontally in the space and placed the lights underneath. So the lights pass through each of the tubes and cast the shadows on the ceiling. For me, uh, the tube shape itself is a boundary that divides inside and outside, but also a passage that connects two opposite sides. And also, I used paper to make these tubes because paper is the metaphor of inseparability of the two opposite sides. So the shadow is on the ceiling over the audience's heads. It is not the usual setting of light and shadow because we usually have shadows on the ground because of the sunlight above us and the natural setting. Uh, but I made it sort of upside down because I wanted to emphasize the idea of non-physical realm by having the audiences feel the weight of the shadow that is unsubstantial. The lights are motion sensitive, so they turn on and off. It is for visualizing the impermanence of the shadow as well as the interrelationship between physical part and non-physical part. Also, by having motion sensitive lights, I, wanna, I wanted to make my piece more interactive. I meant to invite the audiences to participate in the project by letting them complete the space in between the antithetical ideas. In this slide, you can see the differences of the darkness and the shadows, depending on how many lights are on. And when there is no light turned on, this room will be just pitch dark. Um, 
neither here nor there is an extension of the previous work in between. So basically, it has the same idea that I just explained. However, the shadow change was more dynamic in this space. I added more parts of the structure for this much larger space with a very high ceiling. And instead of making one large piece, I had all the added parts separated and floating at different heights. So the audiences could walk through the gaps between the floating tube masses and add their own shadows to the space. So the previous installation has just one passage along the corner or the edge of the room. Um, but th so this space is more, I think the space, the, the space change is more unpredictable here. Um, so the audience's uh, unpremeditated interactions continually change the light and shadow in the space and make the audiences aware of being actors who activate the lights and, and being the object, a part of the physical installation and also conceptually let them stay in uncertainty while creating the space that envisions the boundary between the antithetical ideas of light and shadow. And these are the examples of the shadow changes in this space. The edgeless divide. Um, for this exhibition, I was given this movable gallery dividers the walls uh, for hanging artwork. I consider them large objects to become part of the whole installation rather than as a space or a background for hanging artwork. Um, I attach the paper tubes all around the walls so they are one piece as whole and the, the tubes are at the audience's eye level to bring the audiences close to the wall. Um, I wanted to recreate the meaning of the gallery divider in, in that space and try to visualize the boundary that implies the other side. So using the shape of the tube again as a boundary as well as a passage in this project, I wanted to question what defines this side and the other side and the continual parallel of antithetical worlds or ideas. I used the mirror to invite the viewers to complete the opposite of the physical side by letting them reflect their own faces on the mirror behind the tubes. I wanted to make people see the other side of the boundary by looking at themselves. The shape of the tubes only allows the audiences to see their own faces, but no one around them. So by letting the viewers see the exact parallel spot to where they are, I wanted to give a sense of the other side that is right in front of you, but too far to reach, like somewhere beyond our perception of distance, but is existing where we are right now. Um, these images are from the previous exhibition of the same installation that you see in Wilson Hall Gallery right now. This room was much smaller and had two narrow entrances on the opposite side, so Instead of letting people enter the gallery, I filled up the entire room and only allowed the audiences to peek into the space from the outside and let them see the whole room full of emptiness. So I meant to invite the viewers by denying them entering the space. So to create this installation, I first make pulp using discarded paper I have been collecting. Then I make paper using that pulp and when the paper is still wet, I cast objects, the everyday vessels that I found around me to capture or to visualize the invisibles, the parallel to the visual world. We use those vessels as containers every day, but what we really need is not the physical containers, but the empty space that the containers contain. So I cast each physical object with nothing within to articulate the essential concept of the container, which is the empty space inside it. The process of making these three-dimensional objects using the two-dimensional paper made from almost like liquid form of pulp is my attempt to visualize the materiality of the invisible or intangible. Um, the extreme repetition 
in both the working process and the installed work are for visualizing the timeless space in between the presence and absence. And displaying all the cast pieces in the gallery space means filling up an empty space with emptiness to articulate a non-describable concept, the inseparability of presence and absence. So this installation has been shown in several places and the scale has been growing over time, but this time it's the biggest ever. Uh, when I first saw the, the, the photographs and the floor plan of Wilson Hall Gallery, at first I, it seemed to me, uh, it seemed to be a traditional gallery, like white cube. But then um, soon I found it very interesting for me because it has two entrances facing each other and there is a very large glass wall on one side. Usually I, when I start installing ice, I, I first block the windows. But uh, this one was like a really big and it caught my eyes. So uh, I wanted to utilize this gallery wall, the glass wall to create a kind of interactive space using the, the same installation in between presence and absence. Also, I have always wanted to visualize the weight of the absence by having this installation upside down, which is much like having the shadows on the ceiling above the audience's head in my other installation. So installing the vessels upside down on the ceiling means reversing the natural setting. And it is my way of emphasizing the non-visual or non-physical part of the world. And my intention to like, divide this gallery into two spaces is letting the audiences first peek into the gallery from the hallway through the glass window and inviting them to enter the space that is the opposite from what they just saw outside. Uh, by creating this space, I wanted to challenge the audience's expectation and the visual perception and to let them be part of the space which exists as an experiential metaphor passing between opposites, the presence and absence. Dinner time, um, this started from my question. Our relationship to the materiality of culture for a paper art biennial a couple of years ago. Um, I visually preserved or captured the presence of the empty space that the object contained by casting each of the tableware items with recycled paper pulp made from the wrapping paper that was used to protect these, table, these uh, uh, tableware during my interstate moving. Um, after, uh, so the image on the left side is yeah, the before and after. The paper that actually wrapped the, this vessel. And then using that, I created the, the paper cast object on the right side. And after casting, I um, placed them on this invisible table around which the audience's, audience stands. Um, through the contradiction between the elegant form of dinnerware and the imperfect shape of each object made of delicate yet rough paper with, the shadow, with their shadows on the floor, I wanted to question the fragility and impermanence of comfort as well as offering a glimpse of the absence of time and self. The endless line was created during my residency in Taiwan in an old sugar factory built during the Japanese colonialism. I only used the materials that I locally found and I chose the cotton thread as main, as main material here. Uh, the white thread is suspended from the ceiling to the floor and forming these pillar-like forms. At, and at the top of each pillar, it's a mirror reflecting the mound of sugar at the bottom. Um, the pillar-like forms are metaphors for a boundary as well as a passage between two opposite ideas the tragic past of the abandoned historic sugar factory in which this installation is installed 
and the future of the site as a vibrant cultural park, uh, suggested by Sugar Powder and the Mirror, respectively. Um, this transparent, delicate, and almost invisible quality of the pillars, which are conceptually supporting this dark, rustic building, represent the people's belief in spirits and gods that has long sustained the culture of Taiwan throughout its hardships. Um, when I was there, the most impressive part of the culture was like the gods. There were so many different gods. And then, and then like so many different temples dedicated to each god. Like they have god of uh, medicine, god of art, god of dog, and like that. So it was very interesting to me. So I came up with this work. And also personally, the experience of this residency made me start using the one-dimensional physicality of thread as a metaphor for connectivity or continuity. And also made me think of how we define the passage of time and how time creates memories that connect individuals and the past and future. This is another project created with, with thread. Um, this, uh, the, the initial idea of this project emerged from my very personal emotions about lost or weakened connections to my homeland and longing for my dad home. Uh, it was about the time when my mother's Alzheimer's progressed a lot more, and I executed this installation in Korea after I visited her, who became so fragile in the nursing home. Um, her memory loss made me reflect on the human connections encased in memories and the fragility of that connection. And it created my emotional distance to my past and my home and the tension inside of me, the gap between the past and the future in which I exist. The number 6973 refers to the physical distance between my current residence in New York State and my home country, Korea. The distance one centimeter symbolizes the invisible force, as well as the invisible boundary in between, depicted in the gallery space by the use of hidden magnets. The magnet pulls the needle up in the air and holds it in a fixed position, but does not drop it or fully connect. So the space with these, its vertical strings is quiet and almost peaceful until the audience sees the one centimeter gap between the needles and the bottom of the boxes. 130 small boxes suspended and above, above, suspended above are floating at the audience's eye level. And each box is empty to emphasize the invisibility of the forest. The magnet hidden inside each box physically pulls the needle up against gravity, dragging the thread. This represents time, life, connectivity, and the beginning to the end, it, an eternity. This book is this uh, hair. This book is all written in Korean because I am talking to myself in this book. So the readers uh, can will see the text as more like images, but they can read the colophon of this book in English. Um, it is, I feel estranged by myself being disgusted by my own hairs on the floor. Once they were precious as part of me, but once they are shed, I alienate, I alienate them and even hate them. So I decide to collect my hairs that I lose as my way of embracing both the feeling both of the feelings towards myself, the obsession and contempt. Um, I embroidered my narratives using my hairs that I have collected. Uh, personally, this book was my first response to my mother's illness. Uh, my shed hairs on the floor reminded me of my mother's battle with breast cancer and her losing hair and then losing her memories and our lost connection. Um, I started to use my shed hair from this book. 
um, as a metaphor for memory loss, detached self, and disconnection. Um, because shed hair is no longer physically part of me, but it still contains biological information that is specifically myself. The only difference is in the loss of physical connection. This book questions how this common thinking reflects how people relate or connect to each other. Also, this thought reflects how immigrants are often separated from their families so that emotional connection is weakened and over, or even lost over time, and the people become more isolated from their homeland that way. Uh, to my mother, this is another example created using my shed hairs. Uh, this project is also my personal narratives. In this piece, it appears that I'm talking to my mother, but I'm talking to myself. These narratives are so personal and ephemeral, like the shed hair. They would disappear if I just talked to myself, as if everything I talked to my mother would be forgotten in seconds. I wanted to make them like concrete object, so I embroidered each letter and mounted the paper on this on the thick blocks of wood. So this pro project with hair embroidery is a way of reconnecting and an emotional healing process. Uh, this project is, is very recent work. Even though I started it a couple years ago, I'm still working on. Um, two years ago, um, a theme of time and space and the conflict between past and future was given to me to develop a project for a group exhibition. And this series of work was my response to the given theme. In this work, I explore my feeling of being marginal, living between two cultural realities, trying to bridge two identities. And in so doing, I explore the theme of time and space and the conflict between past and future. Uh, the two primary materials with which I am working are bricks and my shed hair. A brick broken in half represents my split self, two identities, the space between the past and the future. Shed hair symbolizes the detached self and memory loss, suggesting the weakened connection between my current self and my past self and between me and my home country. So I re repeatedly hammered on the bricks and then split it in two pieces. After breaking the brick, I photographed it, and in a repetitive movement, I embroidered on the photograph with my hair the lines between the two parts of the brick. Those um, uh, repetitive actions visualize the concept of ourselves as the embodiment of time passing between the past and the future. Um, no one can connect two heavy objects like bricks with delicate hair. That was only possible on a, a two-dimensional rendering, the photograph of the brick pieces. I see my uh, line embroidering as reconnecting symbolically and impossibly. The gap between past and future, between two identities, reconnecting the two parts of a split self. In reality, the present is continually shifting. The future becomes the past, establishing an identity and settling into the space between past and future are profoundly difficult. So I, ex I explore the concept of time and space through uh, the the four-dimensional process of breaking the bricks and line stitching and the three-dimensional bricks and in the hair and the two-dimensional photographs. So this is it. Thank you. <laughs> Have any questions or comments? Uh, fishing line. Yeah. How did they stay together with oh, yeah, it's like a big puzzle because I cannot move the whole thing. So
So they can be like that. The first insulation in between is like 28 or 30 chunk. <laughs> and then, you know, like puzzles. In the space while I'm hanging each, each uh, tube mess, and then I hang one part and then add another one, and then hang it. <laughs> yes. Hi, I wanted to first say thank you for funding this talk. This was a really good one. Oh, um, I have a question about um, you use installation, you use like different units of an a whole. And I'm wondering if the objects you use are they as important as the end result? Because it does play with that because you said you could elaborate on that a little bit. Okay, can you sorry? Like you are probably talking about the book, right? That and also the um, one that's in the back. There. Um, the paper object, yes, I, I, maybe both. Both of them are important. Because like, for example, that installation. I, when I make installation, I care about the close look, too. Because that's, uh, for, for me, it's a way to bring people in. And it's important for me because the audience is part of my work. So the, like, like in the gallery, I really liked that how people, like while they were like experiencing the space, they also like were intrigued by the shape, like they could recognize like which bottles, like it, you know, like I, that's very important to me too, that kind of interaction because the, the object itself is also representing the coexistence of, of presence and absence as it is, because it's the visualized, the presence of the, what's missing, the, what's absent. So I would say both of them, both the object and the finished, completed work. That's something I just noticed while I was trying to take picture of the, the installation and I couldn't because of my reflection. I, I didn't really uh, saw that, see that uh, when I was installing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay, first. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I really like the, the one with the box and the pin where the pin is being suspended by the magnet. It seems very stable. Did you use some sort of special mechanism to keep it very stable? Uh, it's, it's very, it's not that stable, but it worked. But like when the audience is like touch or like pass by, it dropped. It's like just enough strength of the magnet that pulls that size of a needle. So if I had a thicker needle, probably didn't work. So I, I tried out different sizes of magnets and needles and then you know also the different thickness of the bottom of the boxes yeah so it's like it was like the needle was just you know barely holding that position yeah. because conceptually it's important it's about the tension and the fragility of the connection that I wanted to visualize. When I try to really go back and then focus on that, 
concept, it doesn't really work for me. Like I cannot come up with something. I would say naturally, like the next project comes up and then like, then it's connected to my previous work. I, yeah. Maybe I guess lucky, <laughs> right? No? <laughs> Um, at first, before I start graduate school here, like I was more like a traveler, tourist, that kind of feeling I had for, for a couple of years at the beginning. And then went to graduate school and then started thinking of my art. And then like, I like, in Korea, I never thought like this, but like really thinking of my own thing, just because I am out of my home, I think it's, it's um, I didn't plan, but it's just like, like I think my work is a lot about my own culture and my own experience in the family because I am living here, I think. And recently, as you can see in the slide, the more recent work at the back, it's more about personal. Like I didn't know until like I was organizing this presentation, but for the past couple of years, like I had this chance of thinking about myself and so about my identity a lot. Like with all the incidents happened and you know, like I definitely had some struggling uh, emotion this past couple of years. I, I don't think I made all this work if I were in Korea. And, and the, the uh, reaction, the audience's reaction is different. I noticed that. like mostly the installations, it reflects my personal feeling of like, like, you know, being an immigrant. Those, but you know, you don't have to know that but to look at those. I get that the except installation here, you can just see that as a more philosophical work. I think in Korea, people see like more that way, like not like making connection with myself and my work. And some of my work, they don't even, like I have bad inter like interaction. Like uh, the door, door pattern, the, the book, the shadow book. Uh, Korean people don't like that. I noticed, yeah, just like don't care. <laughs> because that's what they see, you know, you know, everywhere that the, the doors. But here, like, like, especially people interested in other culture, they were like. <laughs> Uh 
Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. That's a really difficult question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the question that I ask myself all the time, and it sometimes stresses me out. <laughs> um, but like right now, at the moment, luckily I have a, I have several shows scheduled, and I have to come up with something for the specific space. So um, two of three exhibitions next year are going to be like, um, like this installation, but maybe different scale uh, or different structure. Yeah. yeah, luckily I have that already. <laughs> I would say part is accidental and part I try to make it like as I planned. <laughs> as you like got like just um, certain image and then I think half of my t half of the time I think I'm trying to make connection with my other work. I have to really try. But at the beginning, it was, it just like comes to me, I think. But I, I found out that it's very helpful to go back to previous work that makes your work more cohesive, like the idea is more connected to the previous work. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, like I have to, like his question again, yes, um, because, you know, it's, you can, like, it's really difficult to focus on one idea and keep doing, like, you know, sometimes I feel like I run out ideas to create work that is in that same concept or idea, you know. So, like, try to control, like, I guess I have to control myself sometimes to make uh, the work all connected. So I go back to my previous work, then whether the material or, Like mostly I would say material. If I connect because the material that I use, I, they, I don't use like so many. I am using very minimal number of materials and the material itself has meaning. So if I go back, try to go back to the same material, I kind of like go, can go back. It's like, a, um, like a, my trick to control myself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. how, um, how does that relate to how you use the 
paper, I, I think I uh, first I start with paper just basically like no matter what I make because I feel most comfortable with that material and then I have the set uh, metaphor of it. Okay, I think I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. My installation first is like this one is not really site specific. So I think I have more flexibility. Like even though I'm like like strictly using paper, like it especially like that kind of installation, it doesn't get affected very much about the space. It's like what I thought like a had, what I had to think more about this installation was the whole, not the, the paper material. I mean, it was already done before, so it was easier. But like thread, that was the like thread installation. Was I was given that material, and I had to, like I got this big space, and I really, that one is more site specific. I, I, I gave the material the meaning and then, you know, design, looking at the space and then come up with the idea and the specific design for that space. I guess so it depends on the work. I think that that's more practical reason. Cause, um, like, if I have all this free time, like I don't have to like make next show. And then, if I'm just like all free and then can do my own art, I would do probably do something else for fun. <laughs> and like, and also like, even like when I'm more serious, like, like. Because I got inspiration from my own feeling, and then I get affected by the world around me. And sometimes, like I'm my my like I'm really into something else probably. Then, well, it's it's a good question, but not just for me, right? Like, like I, yeah. I have to make cohesive artwork. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure that Sen Young will entertain questions one on one with you afterwards. And thank you so much for joining in in the Q&A as well. And Sen Young, thank you for a fantastic oh, talk you. and treating us to a lot of ideas tonight uh -huh. and sharing this entire goodness month and a half process <laughs> with us. Um, we're very appreciative of it and we're very appreciative for all of you who came this evening. So thank you very much. One more thankful applause for Sen Young. Uh -huh.